Hello and welcome to the Best Practices Summit. Pollinator Friendly Alliance is a grassroots 501c3 nonprofit that protects the natural world through the conservation of pollinators. Our co host is the Xerxes Society, a science based nonprofit. First, I, I have to say thank you for sticking it out through this whole conference. Thank you to Lori. Thank you to all the people behind the scenes who are making this conference so useful and inspiring. And all of you who are attending from all over the country and afar, it's really energizing and amazing to see all this um, participation. And, and with that participation, it's it's been a bit of a mind-bending um, thing to get my head around seed mixes for meaningful pollinator conservation with such a broad geographical audience um, because inherently seed mix design is really regional in scope and so um, I just want to start by saying that you know I'm here in the northern tall grass prairie that's kind of the anchor of my understanding of plant or seed based restoration so I'm going to have some some biases there but throughout this presentation, I'm trying to create tools or like suggest tools and resources that, and even just perspective on seed mix evaluation um, that could be useful for anybody, wherever you're tuning in from. So thanks for joining me. Um, and I wanted to start by just talking about what is this meaningful habitat that I, you know, I titled my presentation. And from a pollinator perspective, that's just fundamentally three main things, right? It's diverse vegetation for host plants, for pollen and nectar. It has to create space for nesting and overwintering. Um, and it needs to be clean, you know, free of pesticides. But, you know, rarely do we create habitat purely for the pollinators. Usually we bring all these other aspirations to the table, right? It's like, we want these plantings to be enduring, to to resist all the chaos, the changing climate that they're going to encounter. Uh, we often have like other functions that we want to get out of these habitats. Um, and, you know, I'll speak for myself. When I create a habitat, I'm creating these spaces and to make them these sort of like beloved spaces that I, that I go to to visit the critters that are, that are living there, to like go to and learn from and steward, sort of have this exchange. So, I guess what I want to start this talk with is just this notion that we all have agency to, to shape these habitats to maximize the value for everybody, not just the pollinators, but you know, to really maximize our goals and the, what we want out of the, these habitats. And we belong in these habitats too, is kind of the bottom line. And I also have to start with, you know, this idea that native plants are going to create the best habitat for pollinators. It's been said over and over again throughout these talks that, you know, our native invertebrates have all these really awesome specialized adaptations to living with specific native plants, like these mining bees on the right, that are really specialized on specific plant families, even plant genera. Um, so start with native. And what I mean by native is that it's a plant that that naturally occurs in the place where it evolved. And so there's when you start shopping around for seed mixes, you're gonna see all kinds of other terms like wildflower or perennial, like a perennial mix or a wildflower mix. And, and those can be native terms, but they are also not necessarily native. You know, perennial plants can also mean hostas and daylilies. Wildflowers can be a wildflower in the UK, but when it's brought here, um, it's not a native wildflower anymore. So when we aren't cautious about um, what kind of mix we're using, we can actually have really unintended consequences because some of those plants, if put in the wrong place, can really be harmful to local biodiversity. So that's kind of the, the baseline. So, I mean, the bottom line is one of the best ways to help pollinators in your area is to get to know your local flora. And uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. And you know, here's just a few non-commercial resources. And I emphasize non-commercial because um, they don't have a stake in, in selling you any particular species, right? I mean, there are a lot of awesome commercial resources as well. Um, but start with some non-commercial resources like USDA plants, um, Biota of North America, 
Um, the BONAP program has been mentioned a few times, you know, join a native plant society so you can have a community around you of, of plant nerds to help you learn about these species. The Xerces Society has lots of resources. You can just get involved in your own backyard with a, an app, you know, just kind of learning about some of the species that are right in your backyard that, that bees and other animals are already visiting. Um, as an example of like a BONAP um, a resource here on the right, I have a picture of the pale purple coneflower. It's just like this iconic prairie species, right? But where I live in Minnesota, according to BONAP regional maps, um, it's not present in that state. It's, it's not, it didn't naturally occur in the northern part of the tall grass prairie ecosystem. So when I see pale purple coneflower in seed mixes for Minnesota, I try to like edit that one out. It doesn't belong in our state, or at least you know right now. Um, so before actually choosing your mix or even thinking about the mix proper, there's a lot of kind of homework that needs to happen. Um, some some critical planning to make sure your seed mix is really going to perform the way you want it to. And I'm going to go through some of these, well, all of these in detail in a couple slides here, but, you know, it's like developing this vision, what do you want it to look like, figuring out your timeline, thinking about how you're going to manage it and steward it over time, what scale that's going to be at, if it's just in your backyard or park or, you know, acres and acres and acres. Um, and, and then also thinking about, you know, where the, the landscape context that you're putting this habitat into, what already is existing and how is that going to inform what goes into your seed mix. So this is kind of just like the eye candy portion <laughs> where you, it's really helpful, I think, if you're designing a planting or you're thinking, you're daydreaming about this planting to think about what it's gonna look like, what you want it to look like, because it's, you can't ignore the fact that these plantings, you know, have aesthetic value to us. Um, and so, you know, thinking about what percentage of grasses or wild or flowers do you want in there? Um, do you want it to be kind of like manicured or sort of wild looking? Um, these are two very public spaces and, you know, people who are walking by don't always understand what your goals are. So sometimes you need it to be like tidier. <laughs> this is outside of a public library on the right in Minnesota. Um, maybe you want it to be a little more wild looking, but still manicured. Like you want clusters of color in different spaces. You want the, the height and the structure and textures to be in a certain pattern, maybe so that you can put in signage for educational value. You know, this needs to be kind of visualized as well. Or maybe you have visions of vast landscapes covered in native plants, and that's great too. What kind of light is going to be there? What kind of, um, you know, just like, what is it going to look like, you know? So this is really helpful, I think, as a starting point. And then from there, realize that you know seed mixes are just one component of a successful habitat establishment it, it fits into like four main steps and all of those have kind of timeline factors so the proper site prep is can be time consuming um, anywhere from three months to three years depending on where you're coming from what climate you're in what the existing vegetation is you know, what weed suppression methods you're using, if you're using something conventional that's rather expedient, or if you're using organic site prep methods, those can take multiple years. Um, the plant selection is usually the next step, whether that's live plants or plant species. That doesn't always take a lot of time, but it's useful to save yourself some time for it. Um, planting methods, if you want this planting to just, boom, thrive in the first one or two years, then maybe transplants is, or, or live plants are a good way to go. Um, if you can take a little longer, seed mixes can really take, you know, five plus years to really come into maturity. And then ongoing ma management and maintenance has timeline implications as well. Um, and how are you going to steward it? So sometimes this really plays into seed mix design because you you are trying to get other um, kind of goals out of that, that habitat. For example, I recently designed a mix where a landowner was trying to get bison forage out of it, but they also had a lot of pollinator goals. So we, we had to really tailor the mix to meet those two different goals. Um, so if you're planning to use fire, you may need a lot of grasses to create fuel for your, for your fire. Uh, if you're planning to hay it, or if you're planning to do different hand weeding, re periodically replanting, all of these things 
trust me, they really do factor into how uh, the seed mix will look. Um, and so then, you know, so after you've done some of that visioning, you might kind of question, well, do I need a seed mix or do I actually want live plants? Seed mix generally covers larger areas, live plants, sometimes smaller areas, and usually in a much more kind of clean and tidy way, or the planting looks a little tidier. Um, that's sort of in quotations. Um, and so I'm gonna put up this table. I won't go through the whole thing knowing that this is recorded, um, but there, there are some real differences between starting from seed on a project or starting you know, from, with live plants. Um, generally speaking, seed-based restorations are lower cost per unit of area. Um, they require a lot more weed control and mowing and management in the first few years to get them off the ground um, compared to live plants. Um, you have less control of the like overall look. You put down seeds and you don't really know which ones are going to take and which ones aren't and what kind of spatial pattern they're going to take, uh, but you have a lot more control with um, hand, with transplants. Um, and of course, like the size, the scale factor really matters. So after you've done some that initial visioning, then it's time to really get intimate with the site that you want to put this habitat in. Um, start to figure out what is that topography on site, even if it's just micro topography or big slopes, um, what's going on in the field there, getting to the soils, the, the existing vegetation there, what has been the vegetation in the past, you know, even if it's just five years or, you know, decades, um, what pesticide history has been there, particularly herbicides and insecticides. The herbicides can really inhibit a planting if, if you have really persistent herbicides in the soil, like in agricultural soils. Um, knowing what the disturbance history is, knowing kind of the edge effects. So this picture I have on the lower um, left there, this is um, a farmer that I worked with, an organic farmer, and they implemented, implemented these long, skinny um, native habitat strips throughout their agricultural fields. So it's, they're each about 30 feet wide. And so it, overall, it's a big footprint, but they're really long, skinny strips which have a lot of edge and a lot of agronomic weeds maybe um, that might put some pressure on those. So those kind of um, spatial physical factors play into seed mix design. So one thing I like to do when the tools are available is to actually do some sort of uh, little history project on my site is try to figure out what the site has been. Maybe that can tell you a little story about what it wants to be. Um, not always, but in, in the United States, or I mean, in, in the Midwest, uh, you know, we used to have a lot more prairie than we do now. And when eventually over the decades, livestock and grazing animals came off the prairie, no surprise, those spaces filled in with woody plants. So that can be kind of informative about what the soils might want or what, what kind of plant community you want to, you know, restore to. Um, thinking about the soils and the slope, you know, this can all be really important kind of homework that feeds into your design. Of course, you can't design a mix without knowing what soils are there and especially how those soils drain water. Um, so doing a little homework, I like to use this tool, the Web Soil Survey. It's a free tool um, that maps all of the soils in the United States. And um, so you can map the soils on your site and figure out, there's tons of information there that you can really nerd out about the different soils there. Um, but most importantly for seed mix design is figuring out the, the texture and mainly the drainage class and to figure out, you know, for the unit that you wanted to put in habitat, how many seed mixes are you really gonna need? Do you need um, five seed mixes because you have really dry spots and really wet spots? Do you need three? Uh, it really makes sense to put the species in the right place and not just design one mix, throw it all out there and hope the seeds will sort themselves out. Um, it's, it's a little bit wasteful and not very, um, you know, I mean, it's not very strategic to do it that way. You're gonna kind of waste some resources doing that. Um, getting to know kind of the vegetation that you might be fighting against, or you might wanna kind of coax out, you know, if you've got um, beneficial 
species in the seed bank that you actually want to release, or if you have a whole bunch of a weed seed bank that you really want to suppress, you know, there are really different contexts for which we, you know, where we're putting seeds down. On the picture on the left, you know, agricultural soils where you've had weed systematic weed suppression for decades. That's a really different substrate than on the right, where maybe you've had cool season pasture for decades and you're dealing with really tenacious rhizomatous cool season grasses with a heavy seed bank. You know, that vegetation may impact um, what, what species you want to put in the mix and the rate that you put them in the mix, like the density. Uh, I think it's useful to understand kind of what is already existing in the landscape. Again, it allows you to be more strategic about your seed mix. So if you're thinking about the context around the site, you can plan for deficiencies and then put kind of build those um, deficiencies into the seed mix so that you're, you're fixing kind of holes in, for pollinator habitat. So in this landscape, for example, you know, I, you can kind of guess it might be like a fruit farm or fruit landscape where there's a lot of spring blooming species, but maybe, so maybe that's not a bloom gap at all. There's a lot of different things blooming in the spring, um, but maybe, maybe to keep native pollinators around for those food crops, you need some fall blooming species to keep them on site and happy through the winter um, with, you know, full bellies ready to arrive in the spring to pollinate the crop. So understanding where those deficiencies are is really critical. And Xerces has a few tools to help you with this. This is the tool that I use the most since I work with farmers and agricultural landscapes. It's a pollinator habitat assessment form and guide, and it allows you to kind of quantify all these different habitat elements that pollinators need and which ones you have a lot of and which ones you don't have so many of. Um, we have different iterations of this. There's a one for like an urban habitat, there's some for rangelands. Um, if you're specifically looking for like beneficial insect habitat, we have a form for that as well. Or if you're trying to build up um, the rusty patch bumblebee or really just bumblebee habitat in general, you can use our rusty patch bumblebee habitat assessment guide. So we have these tools on our website for free downloadable PDFs. So finally, you've done all that homework, right? Getting to know your site so intimately, figuring out what you're gonna, how you're gonna plant this. Now you enter the wild world of, of seed mixes out there. Um, if you put in pollinator seed mix in Google, you'll come up with all crazy, all kinds of crazy things. Um, and so, you know, whether or not you are building a mix from scratch, which I applaud you if you try to do it, um, or if you're just, wanting to figure out if a mix that already is existing out there is going to be a good fit for your property or for your the land that you're you're working on um, the same kind of evaluation principles apply regardless so i'm going to walk you through some of those principles um, and the first is that you have to embrace diversity that is just the number one principle if you walk away with not learning anything else um, a diversity in your seed mix is really, really critical. That's the first thing I want you to, to look for. Um, because diversity in your seed mix not only is helping pollinators, a diversity of pollinators is, you know, of course, supporting all this other wildlife, you know, in other trophic levels. It's doing things below ground for, for your biota in the soil. Um, it's helping with water movement in the landscape. Uh, research shows that diverse plant communities resist plant invasion, um, and they're just going to stand the test of time because we're living in kind of a crazy environment with a lot of different um, extreme weather events, and, you know, a diverse plant community is really going to be the most, it'll rebound. Um, and so what I mean by diversity, I want to define my terms a little bit here. Uh, I, I, I kind of created this example of two different plant communities, um, each with four different species. So that means like the richness of each community is the same. They each have four different species. But clearly, just visually, when you look at these two different communities, they look different. And that's because the abundance differs between the two communities, right? Obviously, on the right, you have a lot more big blue stem. Um, even though the richness stays the same. And so evenness is this other term 
where you know on the the community on the left you have like perfect evenness there's the same amount uh the same abundance of each species in the community versus on the right it's a little uneven there's a high abundance of um big blue stem and, and less abundance of the others so when i'm talking about or and i'm promoting diversity in your plant mixes or your seed mixes i'm hoping for not only like a lot of different species so that a lot of richness but also evenness doesn't have to be perfectly even but some amount of evenness across the board okay so now you finally get to start thinking about the actual species in your mix right um and you want to of course start with choosing species that are going to like the soil conditions you have so like I said, you may have different soil conditions across your site. Uh, and after mapping it out, you might realize you have some dry spots like in the foreground in this photo versus some wet spots down by that, by that water feature. So your soil map is gonna use terms like excessively drained, very poorly drained, that kind of thing. And then when you go to look for species from seed companies, it's gonna have this other set of language like dry or very wet. So I just like to throw this little table up there to kind of translate, um, have those, those two um, tools like talk to each other a little bit. Oops, fast. Of course, when you're designing a habitat for pollinators, it goes without saying that you need abundant flowers, you know, throughout the season, early season to fall. Um, and what you might not hear as much is not only do you need those species present, you need them in abundance. So again, thinking about that kind of evenness or relative abundance of them across the season. It's not enough to just have it present in the mix. You need to have, you know, an, um, a meaningful amount for pollinators that are going to need that resource. And then it's also wise to select species from different functional groups, because again, that's going to make your planting um, more robust to invasion. Um, it's going to accelerate the establishment of it. And in long term, it will promote, you know, longevity of the planting. And so every system is going to have like varying kind of preferred components here. Um, but I would argue a lot of our systems that we're working in where we're trying to promote pollinator habitat do need some component here of all of these things. Um, some cool season grasses, some warm season grasses, um, even in prairie systems, we need some woody species. Uh, thinking about like prairie rose or some of the short statured woody species. Um, when you're thinking about forbs, this is, this is really critical to think about um, you know the the long term nature of this planting as it goes through lots of different um, stages of maturity. You're going to want some annuals and biennials for that beginning kind of initial disturbance. The and then you're going to once those this, the plant community kind of settles down after initially getting planted, you're going to need some long term long lived perennials to to stick around. Now, of course, in um, systems in the upper Midwest, we sometimes need like fewer of those annuals and biennials. Um, systems out West might need a lot more annuals and biennials. So that's where, you know, you're gonna need to tailor this to your own kind of system. Um, and then selecting species from a variety of different plant families. And this has been gone over a few times through talks today in the last couple of days. But yeah, there's these plant families that are really, really valuable to certain, certain pollinators. The asters, the bean family, um, willows have, have all these specialists and generalists that really love these plants. Um, but it's not just these three plant families. There's lots of other plant families that maybe don't host as many pollinators, but they host really specialized like maybe this, you know, so the more we diversity in plant families we can put in the mixes, the more um, we can invite more invertebrates to the table. 
And, and if you can hang with me on the plant family notion for just a second here, you know, there's research showing that tall grass prairie restorations have less phylogenetic diversity. And, and you can kind of simplify that and think of that as just plant family diversity than their remnant, like kind of counterparts. So in restorations, you often see a lot of species kind of overrepresented or plant families overrepresented looking like that top photo. You know, a lot of our restorations in the upper Midwest kind of look similar and they're missing a lot of other plant families. And there's a lot of reasons why those plant families aren't present. Sometimes they're, they're actually protected species or they're, hard, they're rare, they're hard to find seed, they're hard to germinate, they're, um, there's a lot of reasons why we don't have them, but it's, it's worth kind of putting in a little effort to try to get them in the mix so that our restorations can mimic the natural plant communities, you know, that we're trying to maybe make them look more like. So um, this is a, a table that's probably too much for anybody to just sit down and take notes on right now. Um, but it's an example of how by adding, you know, a few different species into your mix, you can include a whole new plant family that not only attracts above ground specialists to that plant, but, you know, not a lot of research is done on this, but I strongly suspect that not only are above ground specialists coming, but by introducing those plant families into your um, restoration community, you're probably changing the whole, you know, biotic community below ground as well. Um, so introducing a few different new species into the mix can really um, add a whole dimension of diversity to your planting. And I just want to go back, I won't belabor this, but I don't want to make it sound like I'm disparaging the common species, because as we heard from Heather and Sarah this morning, some of those species that are that are common are powerhouses for attracting tons of specialist insects and generalists. They are very important. So definitely include them in your mixes. The next thing is to include species that, you know, belong in, <laughs> in your region. Uh, and so I've just kind of outlined, you know, a little Minnesota shape up there and give an example of their three different uh, spider wart species that occur, naturally occur in Minnesota. And depending on where you live in Minnesota, you might be pretty selective about which one of those species you want. Um, they have very different like national ranges. Or, you know, if you lived in Ohio, you know, it, based on these three species, there's a clear choice which species really you should be including in your, in your native planting. And there's a, a pretty cool tool that's um, been touched on in a few other talks, but it's this Federal Highway Administration Eco Regional Revegetation Application Tool. Quite a mouthful, but it's it's a really powerful tool. Um, you can click on any one of these kind of eco regions, and you can download like a bank, a whole list of native plants that naturally occur in that region. And each plant had, comes with it, all these different attributes, like 50 or more attributes um, that you can then filter and toggle to really like pull together the species that you want in your mix. And I'll show just a quick, quick example. So I chose this um, eco region that spans Minnesota and Wisconsin. I like to download the whole species list. Can it, it can be like hundreds of species and it can really be a little bit clunky in the browser. So I just like to download it into an Excel form. And I know this is really small, but this is what it would look like in the browser. And I just wanna point out a few of the different filters you can play around with. So you can select species that are preferred by bumblebees or select species that are preferred by hummingbirds if that's your goal. Um, so it's just a, it's a really fun tool to play around with. So I encourage you to go explore that, to get your pool of species that you want in your mix. And then once you have that pool of species, then you have to decide, okay, how much of each species really should I put out there? Um, how many pounds should I put out there? And on the one hand, you do need to know a certain weight because that's what you're going to, you're going to order a certain amount, a certain weight from a seed vendor. But when designing your mix and evaluating mixes, 
you want to think about things on a seeds per square foot basis, because obviously these are species that have really different seed sizes, and it's an easier way to kind of compare apples to apples. So there are four different species with really drastically different seed sizes, right? Um, and so, I mean, this is a way that it's designing mixes on a seeds per square foot basis is the way it intuitively makes way more sense to me. I don't understand seeds or like pounds per acre at all. <laughs> it makes more sense for me to visualize, you know, here's a square foot. And if I want 60 seeds in that square foot, you know, this is, you know, how many of each species I want. Because ultimately, you know, this picture on the right isn't a good one, but you can imagine, right, in a square foot, you might want anywhere from one to five plants eventually to get established, right? So you can imagine, like, just consider this mix. So there's four pounds per acre, right, of those four species that I showed a couple slides ago. And I decided to just put in a pound of each across the board. So that's an even mix, 25% of each species in there. Um, but then if you look at that on the square foot basis, based on all those different seed sizes, you've got a mix that is almost all blue lobelia and a fraction of milk and, you know, and other species. So like thinking about it on that seeds per square foot, it really helps to evaluate what is this actually gonna look like when I put it on the ground. So in the Midwest, we have this really cool tool um, that the Tallgrass Prairie Center put together. And I've dug around looking for other resources like this around the United States. And I'm still doing that investigation. But in the Midwest, this Tallgrass Prairie Center um, tool is really neat in that on the left, you can see it breaks things down into these plant functional groups or plant guilds. And then if you skip over to the far side, the right, um, it shows the seeding rates for different like wet systems to dry systems and of all those different functional groups you can imagine well you know I in a mesic prairie or pretty well drained prairie um, I might only want one and 1.25 seeds per square foot of cool season grasses so it's just a cool tool um, it sort of creates a, a goal post for all those different groups there's some additional um, considerations with this seeding rate thing. I wish it were perfectly apples to apples, a seed is a seed, but of course each one of these species has their own unique biology and some of them are more aggressive and some of them are more conservative and you know there's there's different strategies that seeds take. Um, so it's helpful to get to know kind of what is an easy species to germinate and what is more difficult. Um, Prairie Moon Nursery is sort of a national North American um, company that lists germination codes uh, for each species and that can help you understand a little bit better about you know which ones are likely to take off and that kind of thing. Um, understanding kind of the percentage of annuals and biennials is just just note what that percentage is in your mix. In the Midwest we try to keep it certainly less than 10 percent of the mix but in other places you may want as high as 50 percent annuals and biennials. Um, in also in the Midwest, <laughs> we have certain uh, really aggressive species that we may want to limit. And you know, the converse is that there might be some really restoration conservative species. And those species may almost never show up even when you put them in down with seed. So you may actually need to supplement with bare root stock if you want those species in. Um, Research shows that multiple seeding events over time can increase diversity. So that can also kind of change your, your, your math with different seeding rates. And of course, kind of seed cost. Seed cost is certainly like the elephant in the room that I haven't talked about. And I, I recognize that everybody, almost every project has some budgetary constraint, but I really don't like to start with that idea. I think that it's better to encourage you to in, envision like this planting, this habitat that you, you really want, and then find creative ways to get it there. And I, I'm a firm believer that there's a lot of creative ways to get the habitat that you want, even on a budget. And part of it is doing all that upfront planning, all that, that homework in advance can really save you money in the long run um, so that you're being more strategic about your seed mix. 
um, you know, getting familiar with the local seed industry around you and the prices and weights for different um, species can, you know, be helpful. Um, looking for a seed calculator, this, you know, I regret that there is not a universal calculator out there right now. Each region has like varying <laughs> little seed calculators out there. Some of them are higher quality than others. Um, your local NRCS probably has a calculator that you could probably use. The Xerces Society has a seed mix calculator uh, template that it's at least the Excel form is there and you can fill in different species and play around with the mix that way. Um, you know, other ways to do diverse plantings on a budget is to like start, start with a smaller footprint and then build that kind of over time borrowing seed from the initial site. Um, you could start with a, a more simple base mix and intercede over time or supplement over time with, with bare roots, like these kids are doing on the photo on the, the lower portion here. They're supplementing by um, planting, you know, nectar plants, preferred nectar plants and, and milkweeds for monarchs. Um, or you could look for donor sites and collect seeds and do it as a, like a community event to find those rare species that then you can introduce into new spaces. So really there are a lot of creative ways to make your diverse habitat um, come into a reality. I do like to talk a little bit about the economics of diversity because it can be confusing, especially if you, you're not a practitioner, you're, you're kind of just an educator, maybe just doing one project, you don't have a lot of experience with this. You, start looking for seed mixes and realize, whoa, this stuff is expensive. And, you know, there are a lot of factors that go into why certain species are really expensive and some species are really affordable. Um, factors that can cause seed to be inexpensive or that, you know, these are plants with a short life cycle, they're pretty easy to germinate, they're easy to like mechanize. Um, they have small hard seed that it's easy to clean, like that image on the top, the Great St. John's wort. I mean, this is a plant that the flower leaves like a little um, seed cup. And, you know, I just dumped it into my hand and there's thousands of seeds there that's relatively clean. It's all hard. It hasn't shattered all over the place. You know, plants with those qualities are always going to dominate the native seed market because they're easy, right? Versus species that, you know, are more challenging to propagate. Um, they may be rare already. They, they require hand harvesting, more labor to get the seed um, to you know, a, a shelf. Um, generally speaking, spring blooming species are challenging. Um, they have more difficult germination requirements. They have irregular shaped seeds like the pask flower. Those are crazy seeds. It looks like something out of you know, Dr. Seuss. Um, or seed pests, which is you know, funny with native plants. The seed pests are often actually native insects that we're trying to promote. So like monarch caterpillars can be a really big pest on milkweed production plots, you know. So it's, there are all these factors. And, you know, at the bottom line is that um, it's, it's kind of interesting. So economic value of these plants, there can be really cheap species that actually have high ecological value for pollinators. Um, for, and there can be really expensive flowers that don't have that same kind of powerhouse capability. So I sometimes hear people disparage cheap mixes like, like they're not as worth, you know, ecologically valuable, but that's just not the case. There's not an, a direct um, equivalency there. So just a note there. Um, and then just one final point on this, this idea that, you know, Yes, there is a general like positive correlation between as you add diversity, it can bring up cost. So you can have this pretty simple mix that's affordable, um, but as you add plant family diversity and just like a lot of diversity, you can get a more costly mix. But around this, you know, averaged line, you can have all these like crazy diversions, right? So you can have species that are pretty cheap. Or, and, or you could have add species and have it, depending on what species you add in, you could have, you know, it be really costly on a per acre basis. Um, or you could have a hundred species and have it be a thousand dollars per acre. There's like, there's all kinds of ways that you can make this work. Um, 
And, and this is part of the fun for me. <laughs> I love trying to fit people's dreams into a certain budget. So it can work. So we have a lot of perspective now, a lot of ideas about how to evaluate you know, different species that might belong on your site. Now you start looking at seed mixes and you need some analysis tools, right? This is the part of the talk where like usually I, I'll teach this kind of work on like a full for a full day workshop and we'll work through lots of different seed mixes. I'm gonna give you the really abbreviated version here. So you have this seed mix, it gives you like pretty limited information about the mix, but it's enough to kind of work with. Um, and, and I go through this, you know, rather short series of questions on a, on a one PowerPoint slide, it looks like a lot of questions. Um, and I don't know if we'll go through all of them right now for the sake of time, but you can find them. I wrote a blog post about this on the Xerces website um, about a year ago. So when I'm looking at a mix, you know, I'm asking myself all these questions about the mix. Um, how many species are there? Do they belong in my neck of the woods? Um, do they match the soil conditions I have on site? You know, are there, do they match the sun conditions? Um, uh, how many species are blooming during each part of the season? Are there different functional groups? Are there, you know, where, what's the composition of annuals and biennials? Um, and then, you know, are there species that are really like dominating the mix? They might outcompete others in the mix. Um, what, you know, how many grasses versus flowers are there? Do you want a mix that's like 80% flowers and 20% grasses or maybe the, you know, reverse? Um, and then does, you know, at the end of the day, does this match my, bud my budget? And, and finally, like, you know, even if you want this mix, is it available to buy? <laughs> you might not, um, you might not be able to find what, exactly what you want. So let's take that example that I gave you and kind of work through a few of those questions. So um, you can see some of the questions on the right there, and I'm just going to kind of answer some of them for you because it's pretty small text, and I just want to, you know, do the exercise together. So how many species are present? Well, I added them up. There's 18 total species. And now this question about the forb to grass ratio is kind of interesting. You might start at the, you know, the percent of the mix column. And if you do that um, and you add up each section, it looks like we've got a mix that is about 50% grasses and 50% forbs. However, if you go over to the seeds per square foot column, then we're looking at kind of a different math, different, you know, calculus here, right? There's almost nine seeds per square foot of the grasses and 26 seeds per square foot of forbs. So now we're looking at something that's actually more dominated by forbs. It's a 75% to 25% mix. Um, you know, what's the total number of seeds per square foot? You just add that up, 35 seeds per square foot, right? Um, how many species are blooming in each season? Well, there's three there for uh, spring. Um, and then you might, you know, look at that abundance question. Are they really there in meaningful amounts? Look at the, you know, the golden Alexanders on the bottom. There's 0, 0.0 seeds per square foot. It might be 0 0.09 or no, I guess it would be 0 0.04. Um, but right, so there's, there's pretty small amount there. Is that going to be a meaningful amount for, for pollinators? Um, there's some fall blooming species and the rest are, are summer blooming. So, so yeah, there's, there's some species present for each bloom season. Um, are there butterfly host plants? Depends on which butterflies you're kind of looking for, but there's no milkweeds specifically. Um, what kind of plant diversity is there? Like family diversity, there's seven different families represented. This is not marked out anywhere. I've just done this scratch on another sheet of paper, right? Um, how many annuals and biennials are in this mix? Well, there's quite a few annuals. You can see there in the center column, I have it kind of in a brown color. Um, and that adds up to about 31% of the total mix. So that's pretty high for, for the types of systems I'm trying to create, um, but it might be appropriate for in, in your regions. Um, are the species regionally appropriate? That's where you kind of have to look at the range maps of each one of these species. 
and it, it totally depends on where you're going to plant this. And for the, the sites that I'm usually looking at, there are a few species in here that are not quite in range. So I would probably be looking for substitutions for some of those. Um, are any of the species dominated in the mix? Well, at least on a seas per square foot basis, two of those biennials are making up a pretty big portion of the mix, 40% of the Forbes. Um, so again, once those kind of peter out, which usually happens with biennials and annuals in our systems, as the you know as there's less disturbance, um, what is going to be there to fill their their void, right? So we just want to be thinking about that balance. And then you know, do these all really belong with the same soil moisture? There's there's definitely a few outliers here. Some that re prefer really dry soils and some that prefer wetter soils. So that's a little weird. Um, and then the cost, this is going to be personal for you. You know, this mix is about $200 per acre. You know, if, the, if that fits into your mix or your budget, great. Inevitably, especially if you delve into designing your own mixes, you're going to run into this. Um, even in the upper Midwest, where we have a really strong native seed market, you're going to have, you know, year by year, there are some crops that do really well and some that don't. You're going to need um, substitutions probably. And this is like a, a really interesting uh, scenario to go through because no species is really equivalent with the other. There's always some like trade off you're going to make. And you have to be the judge if that substitution is really appropriate for you. So is it meeting this? Is it the same like plant guild? Um, is it, are you trying to fulfill a certain bloom time? Does it have, is it the same plant family? Are you trying to attract the same types of pollinators? Um, does it fit the same soil moisture requirements? Um, ultimately, you know, is it fulfilling the reason why you selected that original species in the first place? It might not be perfect, but this is kind of a, a fun and, and also somewhat annoying <laughs> part of seed mix design. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, to sum it up, and this is probably summing up the whole conference, you know, pollinators and invertebrates are not optional. They completely sustain us. We need to keep building this habitat and doing it thoughtfully. Um, and we need to be building diverse habitats because that diversity is our panacea. It will drive ecosystem function, productivity, and, you know, on and on and on. And then, you know, I really want you to leave with the idea that like you have the power to optimize these seed mixes to really achieve all the goals for pollinators and all the goals that you have for you, the next generation and on and on. Um, the reason I love seed mix design so much as part of my job is like, there's just this inherent kind of optimism in it and like tweaking it all to try to like make it kind of come to life in the way that we all want it to. So, um, <laughs> Thank you for that. I, before I leave, you've probably seen all the Xerces resources on other talks, but I did want to bring up this one that isn't even a resource quite yet, but it's coming soon in March, and that is a new native plant and seed services directory that will be live on our website. And it's um, taken a long time to pull together all the different vendors and suppliers and all these different um, people who are involved in native um, plant materials. And we've surveyed them. And what makes this unique is that it's not just their contact information, but it's also, um, we ask them questions about their conservation practices and the pesticides they use um, in their nurseries or whatever. And you can, uh, you'll be able to filter by all these different um, parameters to find the suppliers that are going to be best for you. So look for that. Um, this is just a, a draft of what the website will look like. Um, and maybe with that, I will pause and take questions and say thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, it's always fun to see this, see your seed talk. <laughs> Yes, um, people who have attended this conference before have seen um, other versions of this, and I tried to expand the scope of this one a bit so that it would be more uh, useful for a broader audience. Karen, I'm wondering if you can explain what PEMIS parasitic plants are, if you've used awesome. them successfully, and maybe um, list a few. 
Sure, yeah. So a hemiparasitic plant or sometimes semi-parasitic. Um, these are plants, really interesting biology, where they, um, they produce their own flowers and seeds. Uh, but they also rely for some of their um, their carbohydrates. Their their like their growth comes from other plants. That their their root system is kind of tapping into the energy reserves of its neighbors, um, and so it's using some some resources there. So it's it's photosynthesizing on its own, but it's also you know borrowing some energy from its neighbors. An example would be. Um, Wood betony is one in the Midwest. Um, it's a beautiful plant that's really attractive to queen bumblebees in the spring. Um, it kind of, you know, some of the cool things that these plants do is they actually can like suppress. Um, they So wood betony would kind of parasitize or semi-parasitize um, some of its native grasses nearby. And so it can kind of suppress that grass component and um, make the floral resources more obvious, more kind of um, like thrive right there in that space. It can create different structural heterogeneity in the plant community too, because you've got this kind of lower area where the plants are kind of suppressed. Um, Comandra is another one, it's called bastard toad flags. Um, I believe the Indian paintbrush is parasitic as well. So there's a lot of different ones. Those, that's just from kind of my region, but I suspect a lot of systems have these plants um, to, you know, explore. And, and they're, they're not that easy to get established, right? Because they, they require that partner. Um, and so you can certainly put them in seed mixes and they may take off if you've got the right combination of, of like companions in the planting. And they certainly won't show up right away. Um, if they don't show up over time, even though they've been in the seed mix, there, there are a few unique individuals who have figured out how to grow these in, you know, um, in the greenhouse and you can purchase plugs and actually supplement um, them and put that plant them into your planting. Um, you know, if you have, I am a little hesitant to say this, but if you have robust populations in a donor site and you're sort of willing to play around with this and be really cautious about how much you take, you could maybe even divide um, some existing colonies. Often they will spread out into large colonies. So you could do some little divisions and get some supplemented in other spaces. So that would be another way to kind of bring, introduce those into a community. Now I know for this next question that we've had conversations earlier about um, sort of changing genomes based on climate change and things are moving around a little bit, shifting north maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so in some areas, there aren't a lot of forbs in particular available. Um, mm -hmm. Should one ask the supplier to branch out to farther, further out geographic areas in that situation? It's really context dependent. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it really depends. I think, a, so you still wanna do select species that, that belong in that region, you know, that you're not, um, so in that example where I chose it, one of the first slides with pale purple coneflower, um, I'm still not trying to introduce pale purple coneflower to Minnesota, even though it's a Southern species and may eventually kind of do well there. Um, I'm not trying to introduce that, do like that assisted migration. Um, uh, yeah, the way you asked the question, I'm, I'm kind of stumbling on it. Um, well, you know, there are several comments about climate change and species mm -hmm. moving around, and I know mm -hmm. it's a difficult conversation to have. Um, yeah, I mean, understanding kind of the, the landscape context that you're working in, and if there are remnants in the area that you, that may be important to kind of protect then you might not want to be doing a bunch of introductions nearby. 
um, often you don't know what's in the surrounding area and we just need to build habitat to support invertebrates, right? And we try to do it diverse. We try to, you know, in an ideal world, you're bringing genetic material onto the site that um, that's diverse, has a gen diverse genetics so that it doesn't um, kind of collapse, right? Um, and often a lot of our vendors are mindful about that anyway. They're not sourcing it from like this bottleneck population. They're, they're deliberately kind of bringing in some regional um, genetics to make their own production plots stronger and healthier. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on the vendors to do the good work. You know, you kind of have to like ask around. There's there's so much of like what happens in the native seed industry, I feel like is driven by customers asking for certain things. So um, if you want certain materials, um, even if you know the vendor doesn't have it, you know, asking for it can kind of put that pressure on to show the interest, to show um, the vendor has, um, you know, a lot of, of X species that's coming from 300 miles away, but this whole group of people want that same species and they want it to come from, you know, 50 miles away. You know, that's, that will signal to the, that vendor, I should, I should do some work and find a local source of this and create a new genetic lot, you know so that we can sell that. You know, so there's, there's a lot that's like um, kind of dynamic in that way. 